Hey everyone, so in class last time I wanted to show you ways you can actually use the information you've had already to solve interesting problems. I picked an interesting problem that I think will be helpful to you during your project. It's simply calculating the force of drag over an airfoil. So let's get right to it. So for this I'm going to assume this situation. So I have you know, an airfoil and there is this envelope of air that goes around it. This envelope of air expands because initially it's at 30 meters per second and at the end it has some sort of velocity profile which is different it's not the same and so we're going to go ahead and write that right there and at the end it has a velocity profile that looks kind of like this so it eventually does get back to 30 meters per second at the ends but it's 15 meters per second in the middle and there is some height h right here there is a width B right there. And I'm going to go ahead and say that my pressure over here is equal to atmospheric. My pressure over here is equal to atmospheric. And everything outside of here is at the free stream velocity. Okay, so we have our stuff. So because we have an airfoil in there, it has drag force and that actually leads to what's called wake drag. This thing right here, this is called wake drag. Now, it wouldn't look like this exact profile when you're doing your test with a wind tunnel, but it might be similar. Um, and the process we're going to do is how you would solve this to get your um, coefficient of drag or your coefficient of lift. So let's walk through how we can use what we know to solve this problem. First off, we're going to be, you need to remember that force, just like the force of drag, is equal to mass times acceleration. But this is actually an oversimplification um, because the real equation is actually that the force is equal to the time rate of change of my momentum. And so if we need to figure out a force and my force is equal to the time rate of change of my momentum, well guess what? We're going to be using our conservation of momentum here to help us out. Now, I usually write this in the differential form when I'm doing it in class, but this time to make it easier on itself, we're gonna go ahead and write it in the integral form because that's gonna be a lot easier than for us. Um, the components are still all there. I'm just bringing in some extra little details here to make it easier myself. So I'm gonna write this just as your textbook does for this one time. So d dt of the triple integral, it's a volume integral, terrifying. I'm gonna put a line through any v's that are volume just to make it easier. It's gonna be density times my velocity times dv plus the surface integral. So this is going around my volume that, or my um, control volume that I care about. And this is where I see my um, momentum here. Okay, it's equal to negative of integral going around my entire surface. That's the surface integral. And this is gonna be times the pressure ds, and then finally, one last little term, minus the drag force. Okay, and I'm going to do this, and I'll just keep it the same. Now, this right here is we're really getting like how much momentum is going out, okay? Momentum in and out. That's what this dot project is saying, because you know what I care about is if I have a box, I have momentum leaving that box, that's mv. But if it was leaving at an angle, I don't care about the angle. I only care about how much is going straight out of that side, and how much is going straight in that side. That doesn't matter to me. I care about the straight in, straight out version. That's why I'm taking a dot product right there. It's just to simplify things. OK, now luckily for us, we can simplify things because first off, I said that pressure is going to be constant, okay? So on all my surfaces, the pressure is equal to constant and is equal to atmospheric. And as note, that's on the surface. Not like inside of the problem itself, but on the surface, on places where it's leaving and going in, it's going to be equal to a constant. So going back up here real quick, like that would be like right here, on this surface too, right there and right there. All of those pressure is going to be constant and so because the pressure is the same on my little box that I've drawn around my airfoil, well, that means that the pressure is not going to be having any effect 
on the forces. Okay, now because the pressure is a constant, there's something out here. The second thing is, I'm going to assume that this is a steady flow, okay? So it means I get to get rid of this guy right here. So, because it's a steady flow, I have that. It's looking pretty good. This is not too terribly bad. So what I get then, in the end, is that my force of drag is going to be equal to negative of my double integral, this is a surface integral, of my density times my velocity dot ds and then I'm going to pick a particular component but it's component which will be u right here okay u why u because this is only in the x direction okay x direction is all that matters I only have drag in the x direction I don't have drag in the y direction that's why it's a u there Okay, so this is already simplified dramatically, but we still need to work on this a bit to make it easier for ourselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up because this looks scary, okay? This looks scary, but it's actually not a scary concept because all I'm asking myself is I have mass, or I should say momentum, flowing in here, okay? MVN, and I have momentum going out, MV out. And any difference between those two is due to a force. That's it. That's all I'm saying. A force causes the difference. There is some sort of force of drag in the middle that's changing it. So let's write it in a less scary form. Let's change it and make it a less scary form. So I have that. Okay, so force of drag is going to be equal to, I'm going to do the left side first. So negative integral and we'll just leave it, leave it out bound right now density times u1 squared and we know what u1 is because that's just a free stream velocity plus integral of my density times u2 squared okay and both of these are dy because I'm going to be integrating them from the center line up to take into account that velocity profile okay now this is this is fine this works but and I honestly could solve this right now. However, I would have a little bit of issues with the U1 because I don't have any heights for U1, and so that would make things a little bit harder on me. So let's see if we can get rid of the U1, at least put it in a little bit different form. I think we can do it. I think we should be fine. So what we're going to do is we're now going to bring in conservation of mass. And remember, conservation of mass, momentum, they're not meant to be scary. It's just simply saying that my mass in and my mass out, if there's any difference, that means my density is changing. But since my density is equal to a constant, my mass in is going to be equal to my mass out. Or my mass flow is going to be equal to, my mass flow in is going to be equal to my mass flow out. And so that's what we write. What we get then is my integral of rho 1, u1, dy, or da. I could use da if I wanted to, but um, I will, I'll leave it as dy. I'm just going to do everything per unit span. There you go. Now it's per unit span. I put a little prime there. Um, dy is going to be equal to rho 2, u2, dy. And what helps us out is that we know that rho 1 is equal to rho 2. And so we get a simplified equation here. So what I get is that density u1 dy is equal to integral of density u2 dy. Okay, now if I look at my conservation mass momentum equation, I don't see any u1s by themselves or u2 by themselves. I see u1 squares and u2 squares. But luckily for us, u1 is a constant because it's constantly equal to the free stream velocity. It doesn't change with y, it's the same everywhere. And so I can multiply both sides by u1. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now I'm giving you the full derivation here, but there's actually an equation which we're about to have derived, which you can just jump to and use in the future. Like you don't have to use this full equation. I am giving extraneous stuff here because I wanna give you it all. 
And so what I get then if I do this is I have integral row u1 squared, oh, there it is, is equal to integral of row u2 u1 dy. And so then if I plug this into my conservation momentum, I get the nice simple equation, which I absolutely love. And it comes out to be the following. I'm going to write in red because it's super important. It gets my force of drag, in this case per unit span, because I'm just making my span equal to 1, is equal to the integral of rho infinity, or sorry, goodness, my density, times u2 times the difference in my density from the free stream velocity, dy. Okay, we have this equation. This is great. Another thing is we have an equation for our... Um, for our u2. u2 had this like line right here. It went down to 15, it went up to 30, and it did that over a distance of h. And so I can write out that u2 is going to be equal to, let's make sure I do this right, 15 plus, it goes up by a difference of 15, that's a change of 15. Okay, 15 times y over h. That looks good. I know what h is, I know what y is, I can plug it all in. And the second thing I have to realize is that there's actually two of these, I'm kind of dividing it in half. So this will be my force drag prime over two. Okay, over two. And it's gonna be equal to the integral from zero to h. Make sure I got it all right out there, yes I did. Of my density times 15 plus 15 y over h times u1, which I already know what the number is, let's plug it in, 30 minus 15 plus 15 y over h. Okay. That is looking pretty good so far. Now I'm going to go ahead and simplify things down as much as I can. So I'm going to get my force drag prime is equal to 2 times my density. I'm pulling it out because it's a constant from 0 to h of 15 plus 15y over h times 15 minus 15y over h dy. That looks good there. I think I've put all my minus signs where they're supposed to be. Beautiful. So force drag prime is going to be equal to 2 times the density integral from 0 to h of make sure I do this right. Those are going to cancel. So yeah, 15 squared minus 15 squared y over h dy. What is 15 squared? I think it's 625. I'm going to make sure just record so I don't go crazy here. Nope. <laughs> it is 225. Never trust an engineering professor to do math in their head. Force drag prime is equal to 2 times the density integral from 0 to h of 225 times 1 minus y squared over h squared. Glorious dy. Okay. We got it, everybody. We got it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and take the integral of this. And so it's going to be 450 times the density of y minus, make sure I'm doing this right, yes, y cubed over 3h squared. And that's going from 0 to h. And if I plug in h right there, I get that my force drag prime is equal to 450 times the density times h minus 
h cubed over 3h squared is going to be equal to 450 times the density times 2 thirds h. And if I have not made some horrible mistake with my math, this will give us our answer. So h was equal to 0.25, density was equal to 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed, and then I have times 2 thirds, and then finally times h, which is 0.25. Plug into your calculators, people. What do we get? What do we get? I'm actually really excited about this. This went well. I get that this is equal to a force of 91.875 newtons. Okay, so that is my drag force for this particular profile. Now, notice things. First off, if my H had been larger, my drag force would have been bigger because it took longer for the um, wake to dissipate. This is very much like if you have a boat. Okay, if I have some boat in the water, okay, and here's the water all around it. No. What's happening here? What's happening here? There we go. Beautiful. That boat will have a wake. And the bigger the wake is, the more drag it's going to have because it's taking longer for the water to get back to its regular free stream velocity. Okay? It's taking longer for the water to get to its free stream velocity. So the more streamlined it is, the less the water is going to be affected by it, the less wake it will have. The less streamlined the profile is, the more drag it will have. Okay? So those are big things for us. Also, the shape of the profile matters, but that's not something that you decide. That way something you will get in a problem. But in real life, you just measure what you see. Now, I'm going to make a separate video where I show you how to do this in Excel, and hopefully we'll get the exact same answer. If we don't, well, I missed a minus sign somewhere again. <laughs> but hopefully this process more or less shows you what you're supposed to do. Have an absolutely wonderful day. I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.